mode. Welcome to the Federal Green Challenge Web Academy. We are happy to have you participating. My name is Brianna Bill, and I'm with the Federal Green Challenge team and US EPA's Great Lakes Regional Office in Chicago. I'll be emceeing today's webinar. With me is Chris Newman, also from the Federal Green Challenge team here in Chicago, and he'll be running the GoToWebinar software. I will introduce our guest speakers in a moment. The Federal Green Challenge Web Academy presentations are designed to offer guidance on different aspects of the Federal Green Challenge or related topics. Today's webinar will provide you practical and action-based strategies on changing individual and organizational behavior that will help your facilities and your employees take action on sustainable practices and results. The speakers will explain the link between individual behavior and institutional change including a five-step framework to achieve and maintain organizational change over the long term. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about EPA's Federal Green Challenge, which is one of the three challenges in EPA's sustainable materials management approach. The FGC drives federal agencies to meet or exceed federal requirements to advance sustainability in their operations. If you haven't already, we encourage your agency or facility to sign up for the challenge and commit to reducing your environmental impact by selecting at least two of the six target areas to measure results over the next year. To register, please visit www.epa.gov slash FGC. Before our speakers begin their presentation, I'll go over some logistics. The session is being recorded. However, we will only be posting the webinar presentations, in other words, the PowerPoint slides, to the Federal Green Challenge Web Academy website. It should be available online by the beginning of next week. You can reach the page by going to the www.epa.gov slash FGC homepage and selecting Federal Green Challenge webinars from the right sidebar. If you are having difficulty seeing or hearing the presentation, let us know by typing your issue into the chat box and we will assist you. You may experience a short delay on your screen when the slides are advanced. Please type your questions or any comments that you have into the chat or question box available on your GoToWebinar dashboard. There's no need to wait until the end of a presentation. You can ask questions there at any point. We will not be using the raise your hand feature today or opening up the phone lines because of the large number of participants. If we don't respond to questions online, we will email a response later. Also, a short survey will pop up after the webinar. We would very much appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to give us your feedback. After our speakers finish their presentations, we will address the questions and comments that came through on the chat box and question box. Thank you for participating, and let's get started. Our first speaker today is Dr. Christopher Payne. He is a research scientist and leader of the Sustainable Federal Operations Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is under the Department of Energy and is located on a 183-acre campus overlooking San Francisco Bay in California. Dr. Payne's research focuses on the analysis, implementation, and evaluation of public sector sustainability and energy efficiency programs. Dr. Payne will both kick off today's presentation as well as wrap it up. Dr. Rick Diamond is our second speaker. He is a staff scientist and deputy for research operations of the Building Technology and Urban Systems Division at the Berkeley Laboratory. His research focuses on consumer behavior and user interactions within the built environment, including post-occupancy and energy evaluations of housing, schools, and workplace environments. EPA appreciates and welcomes both of our guest speakers to today's webinar. I invite them both to tell us a little more about their research as time permits, as it's very interesting and pertinent to what we all do. Okay, let's turn the screen over to Dr. Payne. One moment, please. Anytime you're ready, Chris. Here we go. Now, uh, do you see my final slide? Thank yes, we do. Thanks very much for uh, the opportunity to talk about change today. I appreciate our ongoing collaboration with the Federal Green Challenge. 
I know most of us in the federal sector are faced with this question of how to address many of the uh, environmental goals that we have set in front of us. And so my hope is that uh, today's webinar will help us achieve those goals more effectively. Um, as we go through today, I want to talk about sort of four key things. The first, I'll talk a little bit about why we think about this concept of organizational change and why we think that's important. Uh, second, we'll go through a five-step framework for organizational change that we've developed to help you achieve organizational change within your own institution. We'll uh, review some key takeaways, and finally, at the end, we'll present some resources that we've made available both uh, on the web and in uh, upcoming presentations that we'd like everybody to be aware of. So uh, with that, I'll kick it off. This first question, why organizational change? Rick and I are actually part of a multi-lab team that's been funded by the Department of Energy for the past five or six years to think about this question of how to change the way that institutions make decisions. So our goal in that research has been to think about going beyond this idea of individual awareness. How can we get people to be more thoughtful about environmental issues and instead move toward a changed institutional culture where the people within that institution have a sustainability ethic and a way of practicing business practices that changes the way that the physical infrastructure of the agencies operate. So that's a little bit convoluted, but let's talk about what that means a little bit more. Um, what we're trying to do here is make sure that the organizations in which people act are fundamentally supportive of achieving these environmental objectives. So why do we use this approach of thinking about organizational change? Uh, first, we think that changing organizations, in addition to changing the people within them, is a key for long-term change. If I've excited an individual to take an environmental action, but they are constantly within their organization facing barriers to achieving that action, they will get worn down and eventually not take the actions we'd like. So getting the institution and the individual in concert is, is a real key for achieving this long-term change. To that end, I think, frankly, we focus too often on the let's change the individual approach. And what we haven't realized is that without changing our business practices, we're getting the outcomes that our business practices were designed to achieve, which is not the new outcome that we're trying to have occur. Uh, finally, I want to emphasize the idea that what we're doing here is backed by uh, social science principles. And so we've been working a lot to try to understand the institutional and organizational literature, and in fact, trying to add to some of that experimental uh, background ourselves so that we have an empirical basis for believing that these programs will be more effective. So with that review that we've done and the experimentation that we've conducted, we've developed this five-step framework for organizational change that I want to share with you today. And this is what it looks like. Um, many of you are probably familiar with things like ISO 9001 or 14001 and the continuous improvement model. This is similar in that the idea here is a process that feeds itself over time and always is looping back through. So the steps here are first to determine your sustainability goals, to identify the context of your organization as it relates to those goals, to develop an action plan that can move you toward the goals, to implement that plan of action, and finally, to measure and evaluate the effectiveness of your activities in implementing that plan so that you can then adjust them and go through the steps again. Let's go over those one by one. The first step, determining the goal. In many cases in the federal sector, a lot of our goals have already been determined. We have executive orders and statutes and agency strategic sustainability plans. The Federal Green Challenge itself has a set of goals that they have been laid out. 
And so many of these things related to reducing energy use or uh, improving procurement of renewable energy or using alternative fuels in our fleets are things that we've determined. But a key element to this, I think, is taking these broader goals that perhaps have been to some degree foisted upon us and turning them into things that are meaningful in our individual agencies. So a key effort that we would like to focus on is making these goals relevant to the core mission of your agency. It's not enough to think about, well, I want to do my job at the Department of Commerce in uh, enhancing exports, and oh, by the way, I also have to worry about being safe in my workplace, and oh, by the way, I also have to worry about um, you know, making sure I'm using recycled paper, and oh, by the way, six other things. What we want is for those things to be integrated so that it becomes a natural process of the job you're trying to accomplish, in my example, uh, supporting exports in the U.S., that that just happens sustainably, sort of, as a part of doing business. So how can we achieve that? Um, in this case, you know, as we said, we have these goals set upon us, and so in the Federal Green Challenge context, we have six goals related to waste, water, energy, purchasing, electronics, and transportation. So, you know, what I would like to think about in this context is how can we take these examples of the goals that we have here and incorporate them into our own agency experience. Here at LBL, one of the things that, well, probably the primary thing that we're paid to do is science in the public interest. We have particle accelerators and genome laboratories and, you know, uh, molecular foundries that build nanomaterials and all sorts of fascinating science stuff. And so when I go and talk to those folks about improving energy efficiency, they often look at me a bit askance and say, look, you know, how is that related to what I do? I want to run my particle accelerator and get my experiment. Well, we had an experience here a few years ago at LBL where our primary particle accelerator was uh, only able to run about nine months of the year because the energy cost associated with operating the device was so high that we ran out of funding three quarters of the way through the year. And so the last three months would have to be uh, science without actually using the accelerator. And what we found was that by increasing the efficiency of the transformers that fed that accelerator and the magnets that were actually used on the accelerator, we were able to, A, reduce its energy consumption, B, improve the focus of the beam in the accelerator so it actually did better science, and C, because of the reduction in energy cost, we were able to operate it year-round and therefore increase the output of the science. So that combination of energy efficiency and scientific mission was the thing that really allowed us to move that project forward. And I invite you to think about ways that you can make that integration in your own agency. So that's the idea of setting the goal. How can we relate the goal to agency mission? Second. An important aspect here is to understand the context of your agency and its relation to these goals. And when we think about context, we've developed this heuristic of an assessment of roles, rules, and tools, three elements in your agency that we want to understand right now, how those uh, are shaped and structured related to your goal, and an idealized sort of after case where um, your roles, rules, and tools would be fully in alignment with your goal. So let's walk through that idea of how to do this assessment. First, this idea of roles. Um, the question here is, with regard to achieving the objective you're setting out, let's say um, energy use reduction in your, in your facility, a key question to think about as you're trying to implement a program to reduce energy use in your facility is who has the responsibility to take on this uh, activity? Who has the authority to be able to make those changes? Note that those two often <laughs> aren't the same person. 
Um, who has incentives to operate in a way that uh, is more energy efficient in your facility? Conversely, who has incentives to remain the way the facility currently is? Uh, and finally, who actually is going to be taking the action necessary to um, you know, reduce energy use in your facility? So often when we're thinking about things like the Federal Green Challenge, uh, we think for the new executive order, we think about the chief sustainability officer or the uh, energy manager for the agency, and obviously they have an important role to play. But there are other people who can play equally important roles. In my example of reducing energy use in a building, um, the contract officer who puts the lease in place for the leased office space has an important role by including an energy efficiency provision into the lease language. The building operator has an important role in making sure that the schedules of the building are set such that we're not uh, lighting and heating the building at 3 in the morning, for example, if it's an 8 to 5 uh, kind of office space. So a key question in thinking through this idea of roles in your agency is who has these responsibility, authority, incentive, and action. So in, we want to think about this, this idea of roles in the context of engaging staff in recycling and waste reduction. So I'd like you to think a little bit about some roles that might be in play in your own agency if you wanted to try to improve recycling and waste reduction in your facilities. So when we think about that, um, obviously one of the people that, or one of the roles is uh, all the people who create waste in the facility, which tends to be everyone. And often that's uh, who recycling programs tend to focus on, is let's get everybody to recycle. But additional important roles are the janitorial staff who have the responsibility of taking that separated waste and transmitting it to the proper um, you know, collection points for hauling away. Um, the sustainability officer who may need to report on the effectiveness of this recycling and waste reduction program. And so it's important if you're building a recycling program in your facility to think about all of these roles and not just the encouraging all employees to, you know, throw aluminum cans in the recycling bin, right? A more effective implementation will include these other roles in the process. The second point, rules of our heuristic of roles, rules, and tools. Uh, what rules exist to either support or inhibit achieving your goal? Um, it's important to look those over. Of course, we mentioned the ideas of the statutes, the executive orders, the regulations that we all operate under. But an important aspect of that is which of those requirements are salient? I happen to do a lot of work in uh, procurement. And one of the things that I recall when we had an executive order passed a, a long time ago, <laughs> Uh, more than a decade ago, with regard to uh, purchasing uh, energy efficient products was that we thought that we had achieved a great result, that you know we had this executive order that said, thou shalt buy energy efficient products. And when we went off and talked to our procurement folks, they told us, you know, that's great that you have an executive order and all, but what we really pay attention to is the federal acquisition regulations. And if it's in the FAR, that's where we'll hear about it, and that's where we'll react to it. And when we then translated those executive order requirements into the FAR, we saw an uptake of purchase of efficient products. So that idea of identifying the salient requirements is an important one. Another element, of course, is this question of how are these rules enforced? And so one thing I want to think about in this context is the idea of training and certification in developing expectations and also this sort of implicit rule of what is the culture of your organization? How do people think the right way to behave is transmitted among employees? In taking the uh, engaging staff in recycling and waste reduction example, let's uh, think through a few ways that you might use rules to engage staff in recycling and waste reduction. So, you know, a couple of these, uh, one would be the executive order that we have in place that requires uh, 
reduction of, of non-hazardous solid waste and diverting 50% of it from the landfill. But similar to the FAR argument I gave, at DOE, we have DOE orders that put that into effect. And then here at LBL, we actually have site-specific language that translates the DOE order. So we're bringing those high-level rules down to our specific context, and it's those that tend to be the things that we operate under. Um, but another important aspect is this implicit rule of how we do business. And so this idea of, well, hey, don't put trash in the recycling bin, and having people feeding back to each other those kinds of uh, implicit rules, those norms of behavior, is an important component of developing an effective plan. Third and finally in this context of rules, rules, and tools, tools. What do I mean by tools? To me, tools are the sort of physical embodiment of the way that your organization does business. Everything from um, job classifications, performance review mechanisms, the forms you use to achieve things like uh, procurement, the physical infrastructure of your recycling programs. What kind of bins do you have? What color are they? What shape are they? Uh, and so this question of tools really boils down to what's the infrastructure that supports the action you're trying to uh, achieve? What are the defaults that people will experience? You know, what will they do absent any direction to the contrary? And what, if any, additional tools are necessary to achieve the objective that you're trying to achieve? So I mentioned this idea of the physical infrastructure. Uh, one example of tools here at the Department of Energy headquarters in the Forestall building, uh, we had a, a, a turn off your lights campaign where people were being encouraged to you know, turn out the lights in their office space when they went home for the day. But in fact, because of the way that the uh, interior had been partitioned over time, often it was the case that an employee did not have a light switch in their office that controlled the lights in their office. Sometimes they had a light switch. Sometimes it didn't control their light, it controlled somebody else's. But this question of the physical infrastructure allowing them to turn off the lights was an important missing element to trying to achieve that outcome. And so that's you know, perhaps a trivial or funny example, but one that we face all too often. This question of standard forms, um, you know, what is the thing that is the choice that is the first one available on the form you fill out? If you're trying to buy recycled paper and there is no choice for recycled paper in the request form for buying new paper, well, you're likely not to get the recycled content, right? So how can we build the default of recycled content in that example into the form itself? Training content is another example of this. We provide training to all employees on a variety of topics, everything from you know, onboarding when somebody is first hired, safety briefings, uh, ergonomic briefings, uh, ongoing continuing education, a wide variety of training content. Does your sustainability objective get mentioned in that training content in places where it would be appropriate? That's an important question to think about because it's a way that the tools of your organization shape the behavior of your employees. And finally, this idea of recognition and awards programs. Uh, the Federal Green Challenge is a great example itself of providing awards for people who have taken these actions that are, that are something to be celebrated. Um, but oftentimes, we don't go from recognizing the award winner to disseminating that information more broadly. So how can we change from the champion, the award winner in year one to many people being like that person by year five. Um, the other point being that we often have recognition awards programs for a variety of contexts, and if we can build this idea of the sustainability objectives into some of those, that's another supportive tool in our achieving our goals. So again, let's think about this idea of recycling and waste reduction. How would we um, address this question you, in this tools model to enhance the idea that people are going to recycle and reduce landfill waste. Well, some tools that we thought about include the waste bins. I mentioned the idea of the shape, 
Uh, placement is important. Are they located in places where it's, they're easy to be seen and likely to be used? One thing we've tried to do here at LBL where we can is place the waste bins near conference rooms because those are central locations that people use often. Uh, we've adjusted the shapes of our bins so that we make the uh, top of the bin different for the different types of waste that we're trying to separate so that it's easy to distinguish, oh yes, paper goes here, uh, you know, recycling material goes here, landfill waste goes over here. Uh, this, so the bins are, of course, an obvious example, but let's think about some of these others. The janitorial service itself is an important tool. Have your janitors been trained to uh, keep this waste separated if necessary? How are they emptying the bins? How often do they do it? Um, and then they're taking it to be hauled away. Have the hauler contracts themselves been adjusted to have an incentive to reduce landfill waste? We want to make sure that the contract is structured so that it's consistent with the objective we're trying to achieve. Right? Um, catering contracts is something that we've seen here at LBL can be important. Uh, often you're bringing food and materials into a large conference room with a caterer, and so helping them uh, remind them that waste reduction and uh, diversion is important, can be an effective thing to improving the overall outcome. Uh, and finally, this idea of mechanisms for feedback. Okay, you've implemented this program. You're thinking about improving recycling waste reduction. How do you know if you're being effective? What mechanisms are there that you can use to understand what waste is being diverted? Here at LBL, we actually do uh, weigh our waste from time to time to understand what's going where. So to recap, um, in identifying the context of your current organizational structure and thinking about where you want to take that in the future, it's important to understand these existing roles, rules, and tools. They can help reveal current strengths, places that are helping you in achieving your objective and barriers that are still in the way to uh, inhibiting your objective. We want you to consider the, the new or the modified roles, rules, and tools that would be needed to achieve the goal that you're trying to uh, achieve. And finally, we want to use this information that we've thought through about these roles, rules, and tools to shape your action plan. And with that next step, we will think about how to develop an action plan. And I will turn things over to my colleague, Rick Diamond. Thanks, Chris. So I wanted to share a couple stories about action plans. And when we think about action plans, we want to introduce four key elements. Typically, what we think when we're putting together an action plan is we know what our goal is, and we want to go forward with telling people what our goal is and how we're going to achieve it. So we jump in and we start with education. But really, there's a step before education, and that's engagement. And one of my favorite stories about engagement comes from the uh, sustainable architect, John Turner, who was called to help rebuild some cities in Andean countries post-earthquake. And he was a very thoughtful guy. He developed very careful plans. And in his plans, they usually started, and this could be true after any disaster relief, you have to first secure safe water supplies. Then you have to introduce utilities. Then you get building materials. And he had this very detailed plan. And he was able to raise a lot of money. He went to this very small um, Andean village in, in Colombia. And all the cement had been delivered. They were going to start building the cisterns. And the villagers came together and they said, John, we, we appreciate the effort, but we really don't want to build cisterns. And he said, OK, um, you know, that's our plan, our action plan, but what do you want to build? And they said, we want a four meter statue of Madonna. Uh, this is Virgin Mary, not the rock star. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? And he said, well, we were delivered from this earthquake, and the other villages have statues, and we don't, and we think it's important. So he looked at his plans, and he said, OK, let's organize into teams. Let's build the statue. And they did. It just took a couple of days, and it was fabulous. And he said they were so already in line with construction and building that they were able to build the cisterns much faster than he thought, and they were motivated going forward. So while he came in with a sustainability objective, the villagers had a different objective. 
And I think what's really the take-home message with these action plans is, can you engage people where they're coming from, not where you're coming from? Because let's face it, we're energy geeks in a lot of our work, or sustainability, and other people may not see things the way we do. And just one more story where we were in a similar situation. We were called in by HUD to some public housing authority where the residents, these were elderly residents, were claiming they were being eaten alive by their energy bills. That was their language. We're being eaten by these bills. So we put together our usual team. We had the action plan. We had the blower doors, the IR cameras. We had all the materials for doing the diagnostics. And our first meeting, we said, OK, we're ready to come into your homes and do all this work. And do you have any questions? And the first question that came up was really left field. It was, yeah, why does our garbage collection area stink so much? And we're going, OK, that's not really our expertise, but let's see if we can find out. And it turned out very simply, the dumpsters were never hosed. They were filled, and they were tipped, and they were never cleaned. And we were able to talk with the housing authority staff. And they said, sure, someone's just overlooking the fact that these aren't being hosed. So the very next day, they got hosed. And our next meeting, we had 95% of the residents show up. Before, we had only had 40%. And they said, thank you. We're ready for our energy audits. What do we need to do? So let's not ignore engagement before we get into our action plan. It's one of the tough things. But first, we want to make sure we're working where people are coming from. Then we can educate. And often, we walk away at that point. But really, the next step is, do we have mechanisms, tools, and ways to enable people to take the steps as an organization that will allow for the change? And the fourth E here is really different from these first three, but when you do your efforts. You want to have some means to evaluate them. And that needs to be built into the action plan. So our framework, engage, educate, enable, is to carry the action plan forward. And then we want to evaluate what we've done afterwards. And we want to give eight principles here as we go through these to provide some guidance. So the first activity, I mentioned engagement starting where people are starting from. But there are other principles here. We have three, social networking, social empowerment, and social commitment, which can all be used. Now, an important thing in developing your action plan, we don't expect people to take all of these principles for every case. We've got eight principles, and you can mix and match for your particular organization, context, and goals. But these, for engagement, we find are, are particularly helpful. The first one, social networking, is that peers matter. What is the community, the peer group, that matters to the group you're working with? People take their cues from others. So if you can show the change you want that's being done by others, then they may follow as well. And an example of this you're probably familiar with, if you look on Google Map on a residential neighborhood, you'll tend to see the photovoltaic installations cluster by groups. Now, if you go to households and you ask the people, why did you put on TV? They may say, well, it was economic. There were incentives, or I think it's the right thing to do. And if you prompt, well, were your neighbors interested? No, no, I never do what the neighbors do. I'm an independent decision maker. But the studies that have just been completed, there was a nice study done at, at Yale, and they showed that people do take cues from their neighbors. And so photovoltaics do appear in these clusters. So as a strategy here, look and see what others are doing and point and highlight that because people will consciously or subconsciously take steps that they see others around them that they view as peers to um, be models. Principle two, social empowerment. Social empowerment just means people like working in groups, or they take cues from groups. And they feel a greater sense of purpose being part of a group. So try to share or, or introduce a sense of group participation. When the US Postal Service was developing their action plan for sustainability, they really exploited this idea of working in groups. And they set up green teams. And the green teams weren't just people adjacent. They really cut across the organization. But they empowered the groups to come up with what were their goals? What did they want to do? And then they gave them the materials and resources they needed to achieve things. So the 630 green teams were able to identify and implement the sustainable actions that they came up with, a really strong model. And the third principle engagement is social commitment. 
we all know that the power of, of social commitment. If we say we're going to go to the gym and exercise more, or diet, or, or take some action, it has a lot more efficacy if we've either made a commitment to a spouse or partner, or we've said something publicly. On the energy side, here an example, when California utility um, auditors, assessors, asked homeowners if they thought they would do some retrofits, those that said they were going to undertake a retrofit in a certain amount of time were three to four times more likely to do it than others who just thanked the auditor for their recommendations. So even that making a statement to an auditor was enough to support taking action. So those are three principles for engagement. Now let's take a look at education. The principles for education, the first, information and feedback, the second, work with multiple motivations, and the third, the uh, value of leadership. Information and feedback can be key, but the information really has to contain information that people value, understand, and can take action as a result of. The classic examples here is the Prius model. If you're driving a Prius, you're getting information in real time about how your driving impacts your, your energy use. Now, people would like to translate that idea to buildings, maybe to homes. Well, we're not as captive in our homes. We can walk away from the dashboard. And we may not be so interested in our household behaviors. So it may not translate directly. And if we look at office workers in, a, in an organization, maybe the information and feedback is of less value to them if it's not something they understand, value, and can take action from. So just saying feedback is never enough. You have to develop and understand what information is important. Principle five, multiple motivations, is, is really following up on the, the two stories I told before about building the statues before the cisterns or cleaning the dumpsters before doing the energy work. There are many reasons why people may want to change in the direction of sustainability. And they may not be your reasons. And that may be fine, because you can always find some reason, rationale, to support the change. Um, an example that we've seen where maintenance people, maintenance staff at a Navy base preferred the energy efficient exit signs, not because they were reducing energy, but because the light bulbs lasted longer and they didn't have to change them out, go off ladders, or take the time to replace things. So for them, the motivation was operations. There are other motivations that we find can play in the sustainability area. Comfort is one, convenience, maintenance, sometimes acoustic, uh, the double pane windows will reduce outside noise. So there, there are lots of energy actions that can be supported by motivations that come from other areas. And the third principle here, and this is often misinterpreted, is, is one of leadership. If, if leadership in an organization is visible and consistent with the goals you're trying to achieve, it can really set a tone and lead to more acceptance of the actions that you're looking for. An example here at the uh, Center for Disease Control, the, the director really wanted to promote health and was keen on having people exercise and take stairs, and was very visible in being seen as taking stairs, leading walks. And so the connection here is between health, it's actually multiple motivations, as well as leadership. And it almost plays back into the, well, less on the peer side, more on the leadership. So these are just three principles which help us think about how to go forward um, with education. And the third of these three is You've given people information, but if you've given them ways that they can actually take action. And we have two principles here. The first is the physical infrastructure, and the second is a process for change. Chris mentioned before, telling people to shut off lights or to shut off their computers. If there are no light switches or computers have to be left on by the IT people for backup, doesn't support the behavior you're looking for. You want to make sure that the physical context can make these behaviors easy and, and desirable. Again, if stairs are hidden away in a building, dark, not clean, people aren't going to use them. If they're visible, aesthetically pleasing, and you can get from floor to floor conveniently, we can see much higher uptake in stair use. So the physical infrastructure matters. And lastly, this principle of continuous change and innovation 
it's really not a single change that you're looking for. It's a process that will move you in this direction. And there are lots of tools you can use in the process. One that we favor are checklists. They're simple. They give concrete steps to what to do. And they can change over time, because the process is you want to have information that's available to everyone, and they all understand what's expected of them. So those are the enable, educate, and engage, I guess going in backwards order, that you want to build into your action plan. And the fourth thing to put into the action plan is this evaluation strategy. Because we see the action plan, thanks, um, as having multiple phases. And you can learn from an, an early phase how you're doing and make corrective actions. But you need to build it into your action plan. You can't afterwards say, how did we do, without first trying to determine what it is you're trying to accomplish, your goal setting. Can you collect data? What are the appropriate metrics on what you're trying to achieve? Can you conduct the measurements over a period of time and get the feedback that you need? And this doesn't have to be done at one detailed evaluation plan. You can pilot parts of it. You can try it with treatment and control groups. Or you can try different approaches and just ask the people what they thought of the, the activities and what they would suggest going forward. So we just want to make sure people are considering evaluation while they're putting together their action plan and not relying on a group to come in after the fact to do the evaluation. So let's look at two examples where we can put these um, principles into practice. And I'll give you one exercise, and then we'll do one together. So the first one is following on our theme of how to increase waste aversion through compost was a, an activity at the uh, Naval Station's Great Lakes where they really aggressively looked at how to increase their diversion rate. And this is some of the work that they did. They had active participation of employees and trainees to maximize the collection and minimize the contamination of recyclables by trash. They asked their recycling and composting vendors to actually track and report tonnage of material produced at each collection point. Now, not planned, but this encouraged a friendly competition for increasing recycling and food waste tonnage collected among different areas of the facility. And then along with collecting food waste from the different uh, galleys, the cafeterias, they switched to using biodegradable plates, cutlery, and napkins to further reduce materials sent to landfill. So here's an example where there was a directive to reduce trash I have the numbers, something like 300 tons of uh, compostable waste was diverted um, in this. So that's, that's a lot. And what I want us to, to look at is what actually helped make this work. So I'm focusing just on the highlighted passage here. NSGL asked their, their vendors, their recycling and composting vendors, to track and report the tonnage of material produced. So it wasn't just anonymous collection. It was what they were doing and reporting back. And once the people, the staff, saw these numbers, it led to some friendly competition across the, the groups for who could recycle and reduce the, the tonnage the most. So if we're looking in our language, and the language is less important than the activities, we're seeing an example of information and feedback. They collected information, and they reported it back. And that was part of the, the education strategy. And it also led to a friendly competition. I want to say something about competitions, because often people think, hey, what if we just do a competition, and that will achieve all our goals? Well, this was a competition that arose um, naturally, because it was a very competitive group of people. So environments where competitions come up are not surprisingly in the military. Also college dorms. A lot of the sustainability competitions came from campuses, where they would post the energy and water and waste diversion in different dorms. And this led to competition, which may have had some unintended consequences, reports of students bathing and showering in the other dorms to increase their usage, um, led to competition. So, Again, don't start with competitions unless you're clear that the context would support it. 
another example of competitions, um, architectural firms. Uh, Perkins & Will is one that has offices in half a dozen cities around the U.S. And for their sustainability goals, they initiated a competition where they asked each office for a couple of months to see how they could reduce their energy use. And uh, the evaluator told me afterwards they were surprised they didn't know architects were so competitive, but people were shutting off lights during you know times where they needed them and asking the, the building managers to um, decrease the heating and cooling beyond normal comfort zones. And they pushed really hard and reduced their energy use, but afterwards things went back to normal by and large. People got involved in the competition for the competition's sake not for how do we be strategic in our sustainability goals. Uh, one footnote to that, which was interesting, in talking to the building maintenance people, they said the competition empowered them. People came to them and said, what can we do to reduce our, our waste lights and, and waste operations? And that actually persisted after the competition, because they felt that they were being asked to contribute and were recognized for how they were um, key players in sustainability. So let me go to one more example here. This is a case study where the U.S. Office of Personnel Management had a campaign to buy less paper by using less paper. Very simple principle. They asked the staff to set the copiers, the printers, to double-sided printing. They also provided computer screenshots to show how to do it. And then on a monthly basis, they emailed results on how many people had switched to double-sided printing. So we're going to try an interactive feature here and see if we can give you a quiz. I'm going to see what happens when I go to the next page and give you a quiz of what principles were employed by OPM to achieve their reduction in paper use. Now, if everything is working according to plan, you get to select as many of the buttons as you think they're principles. And then I'm going to call on you. Well, I can't actually do that. But take a minute, and I'll give you the, uh, the uh, text again. The U.S. Office of Personnel Management's Chicago office began a campaign to buy less paper by using less paper. Their newly established green team asked staff to set default printer preferences to double-sided printing. They also provided computer screenshots to show how to do it. Monthly, they emailed results on how many people had switched to double-sided printing. Did they employ infrastructure, social network, social empowerment, social commitment, information and feedback, all of the above, none of the above? Okay, let's see. Are we, your poll answers have been submitted. Thank you. I think I will, like, I'll go forward with our answers while we wait for your answers. I don't know how long that's going to take. Yeah, hi, this is Chris. Uh, yeah, right how's now, it going, about 55% Chris? of the people have voted so far. Uh, once we get a little bit higher, maybe over 80%. All right. Uh, I will go ahead and close the poll. So if everyone could get their answers in. Uh, very shortly, we will uh, close the poll and uh, then continue on with the webinar. All right, we'll give you one more minute. And I always cheat on the time, so go ahead. <laughs> and Chris, those other 50% are checking their email and they're not watching at this point, so we can't wait too long for them. No, but we, we are making progress with social pressure. We're up to 70% right now. Give us the numbers. When we hit 80, we'll end the pledge drive or whatever we're... <laughs> All right. We'll give it uh, five more seconds because we seem to be hanging here at 70%. So we're going to, going to go ahead and close the poll and we'll continue on with the webinar. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're still here. We're waiting to see if the poll answers will come up. But meantime, oh, maybe we've lost control while the poll is going on. Oh, here are the poll answers. Infrastructure, 71. Social network, 62. Social empowerment, 68. Social commitment, 62. And information and feedback, 82. Well, if we've got the 70 to 80 people presenting, it looks like people are, are voting for, for each. It's the Chicago style of vote early and often here. 
we came up with three or four here, and I just wanted to touch on those. So infrastructure, yes, the copiers were um, defaulted for double-sided printing. Something was made easy for people going forward. The, uh, oh, let's see. So you're just seeing, well, it doesn't matter which slide they see at this point. I can Let me know if you're ready for me to move that return control to your slides. Yeah, you're why ready? don't we go back and I'll just go through ours. Okay, you should be good to go. We're good to go. So, of the five choices, we um, thought infrastructure was one because the printers were defaulted. Number two, we saw social networking because there was a group that was emailed about each other's behavior. They were getting prompts back on how others were doing. Social empowerment. Um, it's not highlighted here, but I think you could make the case that there was group engagement. And so people were participating as a group. Social commitment, not clear whether there was any ask here. Were people asked to commit in any public way? That this was communicated by email may have been one way and not two ways. So I don't see a strong social commitment element here. But there was definitely information and feedback. People were told how many people had switched to double-sided copying. Now, a question for the evaluation team could come in, well, great, we have information on how many people participated, but what is not being collected? How much paper was reduced? Maybe people did double-sided co um, copying, but they figured, well, it's, you know, I can still go ahead and make copies, um, more copies than I may need. So one of the key things here that wasn't collected, at least in this short anecdote we're showing, is how much paper was reduced and ultimately how much resources and energy. So in our evaluation aspect with, of step three in our developing our plan, we'd like to make sure we're collecting the information that really matters, not just participation rates here. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris for moving on with step four, the implementation plan. Uh, thanks, Rick. I appreciate your handing it back to me, but I'm having, there we go, had a little trouble moving my uh, clicker here. So step four here, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how you can develop this idea of what your plan is going to be. And so now we've come to that critical phase of implementing the plan. Obviously, we want the implementation phase to be informed by this consideration of roles, rules, and tools so that you understand your organizational context and where you're trying to get to. And step three, this action plan, including critically, as Rick identified, the evaluation thinking, how can we implement this plan in a way that we can learn from what we're doing. But I want to make sure that we emphasize here that you know we've talked a lot about how to develop this plan. I don't want to get stuck in a sort of uh, paralysis through analysis or the idea that an implementation has to be a massive undertaking that achieves all of your objectives at one fell swoop. Implementation can be kind of overwhelming. So let's think about taking small steps here that take the first steps on a path toward achieving our overall objective. Start with one or two important pieces in your plan, implement them, test them, and move forward. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be all-inclusive. It's something that informs how you can be more effective. And I think having that concept in your implementation phase of we're going to try this, we're going to see how it works, we're going to understand how it's worked, and we're going to improve and continue to adapt over time is an important component of the implementation plan phase. So finally, having tested that out and, and put your implementation in place, how do we measure and evaluate it effectively? Well, in the measurement and evaluation field, we often talk about two types of evaluation, impact evaluation and process evaluation. So on the impact evaluation side, we're trying to think about, well, what was the outcome we achieved? What kind of change did you see? What kind of uh, data are you reporting? That's often an important component of impact evaluation is reporting results. And related to that a bit is, well, you know, do you have an understanding of what caused those changes that you're seeing occur? And that's an important step in your implementation plan development 
is making sure that your evaluation, the data you're collecting, is related to the plan you're implementing so that you can understand the relationship between the two. But beyond the impact evaluation, I think not only do you want to know that something occurred, I think you want to understand a little bit about how effectively it took place and what you can do, do differently moving forward. And so that's where process evaluation comes into place. If you met your goal, well, what's the next thing you can do? How can you be more efficient in delivering your plan? Let's say you tested out a pilot of your objective in uh, one building or one city or one region, and now you want to take it city, region, or nationwide. Um, you know, how, how did your pilot inform your thinking about how you can deliver that efficiently? That's an important question. So another aspect of that is, well, if you've implemented nationwide and you feel you've met your objective, what's the next objective you can turn to? What's next? Um, and you know, as we said, uh, this is experimental. It's OK to test things. It's OK to fail sometimes. And so if you didn't meet your goal, do you understand what went wrong? How, why is it that that goal wasn't achieved? Let's think back then to the eight principles that we've identified that are empirically tested ways of trying to encourage people to achieve these objectives and adjust your actions and your goals based on that thinking of the eight principles, your implementation strategy, and the evaluation you've conducted. So again, five-step continuous improvement process, right? Determine the goal. Think about the context of your organization. What are the rules, rules, and tools that underpin achieving your objective? Develop your action plan for changing those roles, rules, and tools to achieve your goal state. Think about those eight principles as you think about how you want to engage, educate, and enable people. Implement that plan. Um, remembering that not everything has to happen at once, but it's important to go ahead and implement and get things out there in the field and see how they do. Get feedback from that process, measure and evaluate how that worked, and go through the process again. So a few key takeaways here. One thing is that we want you to think about starting with a broad view of your organizational goals and objectives, and then narrowing in for the specific opportunities that you want to address in implementation. Often what we see in uh, people that we deal with in our workshops that we give on, on this topic is that they already have a very firm idea of the kind of task they want to take on and the kind of objective they want to achieve. So they may come in and they, they may say, I want to do this recycling plan, and if I could just get people to you know, read the posters that we're putting up, then more people would be aware of recycling and it would happen. And we want you to take a step back from that and think about, well, okay, the reading the posters is perhaps an engagement strategy. Have you educated people about why this is necessary and, and what would be required? And have you enabled it? Have you given them the convenient bins in the right places that are clearly identified? So broaden out, think about the full sweep of roles, rules, and tools, educate, engage, and enable. And then it's OK to prune those away. Maybe your roles are clearly defined and, and well in uh, concert with your organizational objectives. So it's OK not to focus on roles. But think about the rules and the tools. Maybe you've got a great education plan in place, and so you don't need to think about how to train people anymore. But you do need to think about how to engage them and how to make sure that they have the capability to take action as a standard way of doing business within your organization. So focus on the uh, engage and enable in that context. The framework is a guide to doing this, not a you know, recipe in some sense. So we want you to consider your specific case, but use this mix of principles in thinking through your implementation from goal to implementation to measurement and evaluation. And in doing so, we believe that you will have a more effective and more persistent outcome. So with that in mind, uh, just a couple of resources that we have made available that uh, can lead you through some of these steps. One is this checklist that we provide to you of the things that we've talked about today, your organizational context, how to think about the roles, rules, and tools, 
the four elements of an implementation plan, thinking about engage, educate, enable, and evaluate. As you design your plan, have you considered those four elements? Um, and as you think about developing that implementation plan, have you thought about these eight principles of effectiveness that we've discussed? Social networking, social empowerment, social commitment, information and feedback, multiple motivations, leadership, and that critical infrastructure and the continuous change and innovation process. Uh, some additional resources that are available on the web. Uh, you can find that checklist and other materials at the Institutional Change for Sustainability website uh, that's housed at the Federal Energy Management Program within the Department of Energy. In addition to the materials covered today, we have references to broader um, readings, books, journal articles, that kind of thing, and case studies of implementations that have gone on similar to the Federal Green Challenge case studies, where we've identified specific institutional or organizational changes that have occurred and the principles that were used in helping achieve that outcome. Uh, in addition to today's live training, we have an on-demand training module that's available, Sustainable Institutional Change for Federal Facility Managers. Again, that's a FEP uh, training course. And in that course, when you register and uh, go through and take the test at the end of the course, does offer continuous education units. So if you have a job classification that uh, requires CEUs, that's a training module you might want to consider. I've mentioned the Federal Energy Management Program today. They've been our funders for a number of years. And the uh, temp lead in this effort is Hayes Jones. Her contact information is available here. And uh, Rick and I have been happy to talk with you today. Our information is shown on the screen and will be available in the, um, in the PowerPoint that is distributed. We certainly welcome comment or question about the application of these principles in your facilities going forward. We certainly encourage you to uh, go out there and be effective. And finally, uh, a couple of upcoming events. Uh, FEMPS is sponsoring Energy Exchange in Phoenix. This is sort of the uh, follow-on to the lamented GovEnergy. Um, that's August 11th through 13th in Phoenix. And Rick and I uh, will be giving similar material presented at that conference in a whole track that is dedicated to institutional change. So we encourage you to attend and uh, attend the conference and attend that track. Also, uh, the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference is a broader conference. Energy Exchange is federal specific. Beck is a practitioner audience, so much broader. That's October 18th to 21st in Sacramento, California. Rick and I hope to again give a workshop at that conference, training people on these principles that we've discussed today. And there are lots of people at that conference who talk about these kinds of issues and how to implement them effectively. So uh, I realize we're a little West Coast centric there with Phoenix and Sacramento, but we hope you'll be able to participate in those events and uh, take advantage of the resources as we've mentioned. So with that in mind, that brings us to the end of our presentation today. I think we have the opportunity to ask a few questions now. If there's anything that we can answer, we'd love to do so. So um, make use of the little chat function on the right side, typically, of your webinar here, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris and Rick. Um, this is Bree Bill again from EPA. We don't have any questions right now, so I want to invite people to um, you know, type in some questions or even some comments. And while we're doing that, I would like to just ask a question. This entire session was very interesting. Um, lots of things to think about as we try to um, create organizational and, and individual um, change for environmental sustainability. But one thing I'm wondering, and we many of us are, are suffering from um, a lack of resources, lost staff, and buyouts, and things like that. What What would you each say the top three, the most important things that you think are critical in getting organizational change, if you had to pick? I would just say alignment with organizational mission. With every federal agency we work with, we really try to understand what is agency mission, because then the resources are already in line. If it's with USPS, 
there's one set of objectives. It's with DOD, there's another. And then trying to work the sustainability, the green side, with, with organizational mission. Because people can always find resources to accomplish their agency goals. If it's viewed as an outside activity, those resources just aren't, aren't as evident. So maybe that's a simplistic answer, but that's just where I'd start. Mm -hmm. That was that was the first thing that came to mind to me too. And and just to be clear, we're not saying you know go to your operations folks and ask them for the funds to conduct your sustainability program. I think rather the idea is are there ways that we can integrate achieving these outcomes into the ongoing processes of the organization. So for example. Um, Recently here at LBL, we went through a, a financial systems modernization process where we migrated all of our financial systems from an old version of Oracle to a new version. Right? And as a part of that process, uh, a couple of my team got a little involved in helping them identify opportunities in that financial system to report on uh, sustainable products that were being purchased. So in our old financial system, if we wanted to know, for example, how much recycled paper we had bought in the previous quarter or the previous year, we literally had to do a full text search for the words recycled paper and then try to prune through all the you know search results to find the purchase orders that would be related to paper and whether it was actually Procured, right? So that was a huge problem. Um, in the new system, they have activated a field that allows the classification of what's being purchased into a variety of different product types. And one of the codes is related to paper. So now, if they want to understand what the purchase implementation has been, um, that code is there in the system, and they can simply search on that code and pull it up. So that's a long answer to a short question, but what I want to emphasize there is, you know, our involvement in helping to identify that code as an important aspect of uh, developing the new system was relatively minor. But by putting that into the system, it developed the infrastructure that now allows us to do a number of things that couldn't occur before. So that's an example of a, a, a small incremental outlay that can integrate achieving a sustainability objective into a otherwise, quote, standard business practice, and by doing so, you know, unify both. And just to follow up on that as well, often in our activities, what we report are the energy and water reduction but to many people, that's not very compelling. If you translate that into dollars, then people see the value to the organization. So make sure that you can show where the value is to the key decision makers. That's a very good point. Um, sometimes these absolute numbers of energy or water reduction just don't have a lot of meaning to everybody, but dollars often does, and it's a very good point. Tons of CO2 equivalent isn't the most compelling thing to your um, financial team. Not always, no. <laughs> we, ha we do have one question. I think this is one that I can actually answer. Do you have contact information for what they did at, at Great Lakes in reducing waste by being able to compost? That is something I am trying to get started at my VA facility. Um, and I can just give a little context here. Chris Newman and I here in uh, the Great Lakes region in Chicago uh, put together maybe a, a dozen case studies that it looks like Rick and Chris um, pulled some examples from. And one of them was um, Naval Station Great Lakes and their um, their recycling efforts. So we'd be happy to send out those case studies to the people in the, on the webinar. And uh, there's there's uh, contact information on each on each one. We try to be uh, you know good guests for our hosts. So. No, we appreciate that. <laughs> I am not seeing any other uh, questions. Are, are you? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. This one came in for bringing a pilot project to a nationwide practice. Any tips for replicating the champion role from one site to many? Is it a matter of focusing on rules and tools? 
Mm, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, an important element, you use the word champion, and, and I think that's a very powerful word. Um, to me, it's carefully related to that leadership principle that we mentioned. One of the things about leadership or champions, to me, is that the champion is somebody who says, in effect, it's okay to do things differently than we've done them before. They give the sort of social cover to experiment. And as a result, they can be really important elements in achieving this organizational change objective because you need somebody who allows the experimentation to do the things differently than you've done in the past. So I think one important thing is to identify champions that already exist in your agency, right? look for the, the bright spots out there in your agency and highlight them um, so that you, people also in your agency can see that they're not alone in thinking about these issues. Second, I think where you find those bright spots and highlight them to the degree that you can get them talking to one another so you start developing a peer group um, that develops the kind of social engagement that then other people want to join, and that becomes a, a positive feedback loop to getting more and more champions developing over time across your facility. So I wouldn't say there's any magic uh, mechanism for developing champions within your institution, but I think often we all have them, and it's a matter of finding them and highlighting them more than creating them, I would say. I can just add one additional thought on that. We, um, our team did a study of the champions who had submitted for FEMP awards, and we were curious what motivates champions in their organizations, and what role does getting an award act as a, a motivator, and one of the, the findings was that people said that they're not motivated because of getting an award. They're motivated because they like doing the right thing. They're, they're people who just like to get in and, and try new things and, 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 and do the right thing. But what the award does is it gives them visibility which allows others to see how it can be done. So to add on to Chris's thoughts, some type of recognition and award not only acknowledges the work that's being done, but it shows others that they can step up too. So if you're looking at a replication model, uh, recognition and award can, can help. I won't say it will solve the problem, but Chris has thought that those leaders, natural leaders, are in the organizations. They just need to be found and empowered is important, and one way they can be empowered is through recognition. And so to go back to the, the question you asked about the idea of the rules and the tools, and I think that would be a tool that I would try to put into place, is this okay. idea of identifying your champions and, and raising their visibility somehow. That might be through an awards program, it might be through a newsletter, um, it might be through you know, agency-wide emails, whatever you might consider. Uh, and then that, that tool of allowing them to communicate among themselves and, and identifying themselves as bright spots. If there's a way to set them apart and, and support that, it's a good thing, right? So um, sharing a telephone directory or email directory of the people who have won those awards or um, you know, setting up a listserv for people who are working on the same kind of problem. Those are tools that can be put in place that would help you support and develop those champions. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, let's go to the next one. Do you provide assistance to agencies launching sustainable behavior campaigns? <laughs> uh, do we provide assistance? Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, in a couple of ways. First, uh, the Federal Energy Management Program does provide us with funding for the work that we do, and so uh, in some cases we have engaged with agencies to support some of their activities. But as you might expect, in our area of limited resources, um, 
you know, the amount of time that we have paid by FEMP to do that is relatively small. We're working to try to incorporate uh, some of this training on organizational change principles into some of FEMP's other funding streams to agencies, for example, the AFEC grant program. So that might be another element. And finally, of course, we do uh, here at LBL and the other national labs that are part of our multi-lab team do direct work for others um, contracts. So if there are specific uh, ways that we can provide assistance and you want to try to fund us to come in and do that work, we can certainly work with you to establish those contract vehicles and, and work with you. Do you maintain a list of, um, you know, where you might be speaking or holding seminars in various parts of the country by chance? Uh, we have not been doing a lot of speaking because of this resource thing. I would say that our, our major activities over the past couple of years have been the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference, upcoming this energy exchange, uh, and the other one at which we have spoken from time to time is the uh, ACEEE Summer Study, which is biennial. But, you know, I think what we are trying to do is uh, make our material more readily available. And so we'll certainly post a list of the speeches we have given and um, those that we can predict are going to come, like Energy Exchange and Beck, on the FEP website. One thing, on the uh, BEC conference, we did the workshop last time. It was an interactive workshop, and it was after the conference. And Beck hosted it, but you did not have to register for the conference. And the, the workshop was um, very inexpensive or free for federal uh, customers. So if you're looking for a training and you can get to Sacramento, it, it's not confirmed that we'll be doing it this year, but we've proposed it. And it is an opportunity where um, Beck would host it, but you don't have to register for the conference. You just have to get there. And we did a two, three hour training. I think we've done hour and a half up to three hour trainings. Great, well thanks all. And if you want to follow up, you've got our email and phone number information. Thank you very much. Um, we just have one comment uh, I wanted to mention. Somebody asked about CLPs, which I think are continuous learning points. And I think this is something we'll have to forward to um, our headquarters counterpart. I do not think that we can offer that for this webinar, but we'll have to look into that. And I think we have had another question come in. Too. Yes, uh, there was one more question. Uh, very reading the entire question, which has a statement. Uh, very interesting talk. I really appreciate all the strategies, yet I believe they are more within an organization. How can we promote industrial symbiosis amongst different industries? Hmm. So I guess this would be working outside of your facility and yeah, I, I think that's maybe down suppliers or service providers, I guess. Okay. Right. Um, certainly one example of that from Executive Order 13514 was the Section 13 working group that dealt with supply chain and greening the supply chain. So certainly there are ways that we can think uh, broadly, you know, outside our own institutions. I confess that our analysis has primarily been within an institution yeah. focus because we've been thinking about supporting agencies in achieving their uh, strategic sustainability performance plans, for example. But uh, that said, I do think that some of the things related to the tools and enabling that we've discussed um, involve players within the, or outside your organization, your vendors, uh, your your you know procurement channels, uh, those kinds of things. And so I think there are ways that you can incorporate your own organizational sustainability objectives into the business practices that you do with the people with whom you do business, and that, of course, has its own impact. Um, in a broader context, if you think about agency mission to change, for example, you know, emissions practices in the chemical manufacturing industry or something, uh, 
frankly, I'd say that's outside of our research scope right now, but uh, if you want us to think about it, we'd love to discuss a work for others contract. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's something directly, say, with alternate fuel vehicles where people aren't going because there aren't stations close by providing the fuels, having some sort of web app that would show you where the stations are so that we're bringing people from the organization to the, the infrastructure that's needed to support them outside their, their, their organization. So I think it's a very good question. We just haven't pursued it, um, and we'll be happy to, to think about that. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we did have a question on uh, CLPs, and uh, I, I think basically to sum it up, uh, you know, is there a way to get CLPs for uh, the FGC webinar and other web this one and other webinars that the FGC offers? Um, they can get overall CLPs if their organization lets them. Uh, but we have not registered our webinars with uh, FAI FATAS, I guess, FAI TAS, or for direct uh, CLPs from BAU. So uh, that you know, it's uh, all very informal. Uh, we haven't formalized any CLPs for our program, and uh, it depends on uh, what your organization allows. So. And just to emphasize what I mentioned earlier, the FEMP uh, training website that's on-demand training on this topic area does offer a CEU. I think those CEUs are specific to application in certain job classifications, but that information is available on that website. So I encourage you to check that out if it's something that you want to pursue. Okay. Thank you for adding that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any more questions, so we'll be closing the webinar. Thank you for participating in today's FGC Web Academy call, and a special thanks to our speakers, uh, Drs. Chris Payne and Rick Diamond. Please join us next month for a webinar on updates to GSA's purchasing tool and an overview of the new executive order. And we'll be posting updates on the Federal Green Challenge website, epa.gov. FGC. We hope you can participate. Uh, we will be sending out a uh, automated survey and we appreciate um, your feedback which will help us to improve our calls in the future. Thanks so much and the webinar is over. Thank you. <laughs>